Testing. Testing. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so does it mean we can go now? Is everyone watching? I Hi, everyone. Hello. All right, let me, uh, let me get this ball watching? rolling. Is that what it is? Or I, th I think people are watching. Sorry, you guys got to bear with us. This is our first time doing uh, a Zoom Q&A and having a Zoom premiere. Um, all right, so we're good to go. Let me let me start off saying hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Q&A with the director and the stars of Stealing School. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you have watched the film Vimeo premiere today before heading over here. But for those of you who haven't, I mean, the film is is like a courtroom drama. The characters certainly want to think it's a courtroom drama, uh, <laughs> it, but it's set in an academic institution. And it's looking at the social and the racial politics and aggressions at play in our institutions and in our streets right now. Uh, the movie is currently available on Vimeo On Demand, and it lands on Apple TV and iTunes on Tuesday. Um, you know, and I, I want to thank Game Theory Films for putting this premiere and uh, Q and A and everything together. And thank you also to Real Asian for their support and putting uh, in promoting this event. And thank you for everyone here on Zoom for joining us. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Radian Simon Play, film critic at CTV's Your Morning and Now Magazine, and I'll be moderating this conversation with Stealing School's director and cast. So uh, let me just have everyone say hello. We'll go from left to right. Uh, first of all, director, writer, Lee Dong, say hello or wave hello. Hello, I'm Lee Dong, director hey. and writer. <laughs> and actor, Celine Tsai. Hi. Uh, another actor, Mpo, Mpo Kowaho. Hey, how you doing? Umpo Pajo here. Hey, and then uh, another actor, Jonathan Keltz. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Hey. Uh, all right. So, Lee, I mean, or, I mean, first of all, how's everyone feeling today? Doing good. <laughs> the film is, is this out. the premiere we expected? Uh, for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Lee, your movie, uh, I mean, first of all, this is, I guess, as close as it comes to you giving birth to your first child, and this is the way you're doing it. Um, <laughs> I mean... So, yeah. talk to us about how long have you been carrying this child? Like, how long has this movie uh, been in your life? It's been a long term, much longer than it should, than uh, most pregnancies, I'd say. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, we finished the movie last year. We shot the year before that. It's been it's been a long process, but um, this week has really been a relief for me because I, I kind of feel like I'm not that much different than like a little kid who like did some finger painting and then like ran to their parents, like, look what I did or ran to like anybody the show, like, look what I did. Like the, the showing people look what I did is as much a part of the process as the making of it, right? Like films need an audience, art needs people to look at it. And I feel like this week I finally kind of finished working on the movie. I'm sure I'm wrong, but you know, it, it feels that way for me. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think it's uh, ironic that, you know, you're, the character in this film, Celine's character, she's, she's really eager to see herself graduate and see have her parents see the graduation and be part of the ceremony. And in a way, this is your graduation ceremony. It was kind of robbed from you. <laughs> you didn't, I mean, in a way, you didn't get to have the, it's not in theaters, but we're doing it this way. I was more upset that we didn't get to have a party. Like, <laughs> I, I just really wanted to have a party. And uh, that was almost more upsetting than the theatrical. But yeah, no. I'm, you know, it is what it is. And yeah. I'm happy the movie's out and people have a chance to see it for right. the most part. Zoom party after this is done, okay? Absolutely. I'm holding on to this. Can I open this? I'm going to do it. <laughs> there you go. Oh, there you go. There you go. Right. I'm going to send somebody a message. I only have my water right now. Um, I feel like okay, so just to, sorry, to talk about the kind of the genesis of the story, um, you, do you want to do you, do you have a ceremonial crack? Is that what you're doing right now? It's going, it's going very slowly. But <laughs> <laughs> don't don't worry, I I have a cocktail as well. So here, cheers, congrats, cheers. guys. Cheers. I have my big nice. water bottle. I'm glad I finally got to be with. I have a cup of warm water, like a good Chinese person. All right. <laughs> well, I I got a double water myself. Same with me. Nice. Um, all right. Well, I mean, Lee, I'm just still gonna start stay on you for a second. Like, okay, like you went to law school. So yeah. immediately, that's the first thing I need to hear to know that, you know, there's obviously aspects of your life that is in this film. Uh, yeah. And I imagine there's, you know, whether it's interactions that you've had or the expectations of Asian parents, all of these things would have played into the script. But so talk about how your life, what as, uh, part, uh, the aspects of your life that, that formed the genesis of this movie. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, being in law school, I heard about these tribunals, being um, an Asian immigrant, I have Asian parents and they expect certain things from you. And um, it all sort of came together when I watched like other courtroom dramas that I felt was a really good story structure to 
uh, be number one, really cheap, but also be able to hit on a lot of different themes, right? There's constant momentum in the story. There's constant conflict. It gives you this opportunity to bring in different perspectives, different people in the same area where they uh, collide with each other. So I, I really like the idea of a courtroom drama and I heard about these tribunals and I thought it would be a good vehicle to uh, write a movie about uh, using that genre to talk about all the things that I care about, including you know issues of race and gender and the importance of a liberal arts degree and, uh, and you know pleasing your parents, failing your parents and um, you know all that good stuff. Right, right. Well, uh, I mean, Celine, I wanted to talk mm -hmm. to you about your character because I mean, your character, she's ambiguous, you know, like you can't really nail her down. And, you know, uh, the other thing is like, she just never gets to really speak for herself because part of the point of the movie is everyone here is trying to speak on her behalf. Right. Um, and that could be challenging to play, you know, when you don't even have that many opportunities to express yourself as a character uh, for the actor to play that. But I think there's a lot to be said about, there's something rich in the way this character looks at people, um, you know? And I think, I mean, I mean like the, the biggest takeaway from uh, April is that she can see right through people. And I just want to know, I mean, talk to me about kind of like trying to performing that, like uh, creating a character and building a character when you don't have much to say, but doing that and, and, and you know, making a three-dimensional character that way. Mm, it's really interesting to me that you see her as ambiguous because that definitely, I can see that now looking at the film from the outside, but that wasn't, it's not something I ever aimed to play. I think that would be kind of an impossible thing to try to be ambiguous, but um, I mean, really drawing from uh, a, a way I cope with my own energy too is that April like draws everything inside. Everything is being coped with inside. Um, and that's like cultural conditioning. That's a lot of different influences. So it was really fun to draw on these things that are that are at play in my own life, um, and at the same time, like can be triggering and can like feel really vulnerable because they are so much at play in my own life. Um, funny that you say about the eyes. Lee, you used to call, what did you call my eyes? Dagger eyes? I think murder, murder <laughs> eyes, dagger eyes. I think, yeah, I think they're something <laughs> like that. <laughs> like, a step beyond cut eye? I was deeply afraid of throughout uh, the auditions and throughout filming. So yeah. It was, it was written in like an official document. I think it was on the call sheet. Like this scene is like, or the dagger eyes shot or the murder yeah. eyes yeah. It was It was the looks back and forth between us, like sitting yeah. down, like we had those specific setups there. Yeah, that was our shorthand on set for, um, just these hateful looks. Dang yeah, <laughs> which I loved giving. Um, They're all in there. They're all in the movie. Every single one. Yeah. I know it's so fun, um, especially because I don't know. In real life, there's such a need to apologize for those things. So it was, felt so freeing to like to be like, I'm not getting punished as, as this because this is a character. When actually, it's really me who loves giving these murderous looks. Um, but as for voicing too, like. Yeah, expressing all that she needed to say through her eyes and through being a watcher actually gives April a sense of power when it doesn't feel like her voice can be expressed. Mm. Well, I mean, to expand this out further, uh, especially when you talk about the dagger eyes at Keith, um, you know, uh, I mean, I think it says a lot about your character, the way she looks at Jonathan's character like that like that that like he, on the one hand this movie is about how Jonathan character who is sorry I should have said like if for those who haven't seen it he is a TA who is trying to uh nail uh Celine's character April for plagiarizing an essay which we don't know whether she did or not and so this whole tribunal is because this guy really wants to nail her for that um now but but the way she looks at Jonathan I think says a lot about who Celine is but uh, sorry who April is, but also about uh, says a lot about like uh, what her experiences have been, um, and so I'm wondering, like, I mean, talk to me about what what do you think the backstory for April is, or is that backstory even borrowed from your own life or your own experiences? Mm. Sorry, I'm going there. We're going to go. A great there. question. Oh, we're going straight in. We're going. Okay. Um, I love rewatching the first scene where um, the the first flashback, which is like the earliest time we see of April and Keith interacting. Um, because her energy around him is different at that time. It's that revered, oh, this is someone who's above me in, um, in education. And so there's like a, I mean, there always is a power dynamic, but it's a, it's a different dynamic in that first one. And, and yeah, this really does draw on personal experience. Unfortunately, I feel like, um, I mean, I've also had my share of 
um, going to a university for a bit and then a college and getting a degree and feeling so disillusioned by like what, like not realizing, not realizing how many pieces are at play, which I think this film does a great job showing is that there's so many behind the scenes conversations that, that are contributing to like what's actually playing out. And so I, I appreciate that April has this, it seems like by the time the tribunal has come about, she has, she totally has this savvy, like she, she's aware of the powers at play and the dynamics. And she is, she's in a system where she's being taken advantage of. She, she's aware of that. And then she uses her positioning as well to take advantage of other people. Um, so I love that savvy. I wish I had that savvy when I'd gone to school. Maybe things would have been different. I don't know. Me too, by the way. <laughs> uh, by the way, I should uh, tell the audience, um, if you want to drop in a question, you just go into the Q&A function and drop your questions in there. Um, and, you know, I'll go back and forth between the two. So right now I'm going to jump to the first question I see in the, the Q&A box. Uh, uh, I guess this is for Lee, but maybe others can answer. Any personal favorite courtroom dramas or specific films that are of a particular influence on this film? Yeah, um, there was an Israeli movie called Get. It was about a GEPT, the trial of Vivian Absalom. It was all in one room. It was about a woman trying to get a divorce um, in in Israel. And it was the best. It, it was it was the best um, comparison for this movie because it was funny. It was dramatic. It had a social commentary element. It was thrilling and it was mysterious. Um, and I wanted to sort of do something like that where it would have all these different um, emotions in it. And you know, but have it all contained in one room with uh, with one cast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that I did see that movie. That is a great film. Um, now, okay, Jonathan. Uh, uh, you, okay, let's talk about your character because like, hey, I think <laughs> I think it says a lot about how talented you are that I wanted to punch you in the face so hard. What <laughs> 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 did I? <laughs> so it's like you know, and here's the thing: like, it's it's like. This is, I mean, on the one hand, I want to say, man, is there anything redeeming about this character? But I know there is, because the way you played him, you play him so convincingly, you must have found his humanity. You must have found his vulnerability. Um, so talk to me about that. Like, how do you, where did you find that stuff in this character? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think that, you know, I and the other actors involved in the film, and actors in general can, you know, can say that it, it always... It, has to start with the writing and I think that the longer that you're in this industry the more you value good writing and you know that was something that was so appealing about the project already and I think that a lot of that nuance was already written into to Keith but something that we talked about and something that I think really was important is why 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 on earth is he going to this extent why is he coming down so hard on this one student, on this one girl, you know? And obviously it has to be something that's so incredibly personal. And we see moments of it in, you know, in his conversations, you know, just where you see how difficult it is for him to find an opportunity, you know, as a professor where he's really, he's thinking he's done all of these different things. He's done everything right. He has worked so hard and, you know, because of his privilege and his entitlement, he feels like that means that he deserves a certain result. And because he doesn't get that, he's, you know, not, and not only does he not get that, but this woman is spitting in the face of everything that he holds so dear. And not only is she doing that, but she is actively succeeding in spite of all of that and because of all of that. And so the personal, you know, uh, insult to his privilege, I think is really what launches his tirade. And, you know, and I think that as he, he loses and gains control, he, he makes it more personal and then he makes it racially charged as well. And then he really, it's just, it's no holds barred. Like he doesn't care if, if everyone loses out of this situation, as long as she loses, you know? And I think that that, that insecurity and that, you know, that refusing to, to look at his own shame of himself and projecting it onto her as disrespect, you know, I think that that's something that's very human. And so I think that that's a huge part of how he gets so vitriolic in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, okay, so then let me turn it back to Lee, right? Because you, you said something. You said entitled, he has his entitlement. He's, had, he's cool. done his hard work, but he also has his entitlement. Lee, I mean, when you're creating a character like this, does it 
force you to also like to like, I mean, talk about the, the, the experience of you being an Asian guy, having to sympathize, having to understand the vulnerability and the like see past the entitlement of this white character and see and creating, finding his vulnerability in the writing. Cause uh, you know, clearly Jonathan credited the writing as well on this. Um, well, well, I, I personally don't think the writing did as much as Jonathan did for his character. Like he came in like red hot, ready to be, very disliked. I think we shot. <laughs> I think we shot like in order. So like day one, when you do, when you didn't like him right away, like you know that was day one on shooting as well. And he came in ready to go. I don't know how he got into character. Didn't ask. Um, but um, but yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I am a guy after all, and um, I guess I I understand. I, I came from a place where I was told if I just did really well in school, everything would fall into place for me. I think that's, Keith and I share that belief. And, um, and school was the end all and be all for me. And at some point in my life, I realized that, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily correspond to success later in life. Um, April, I hope, I think I tried to show that April learns that lesson at some point during the movie. Um, and John Jonathan's character, Keith, is someone who refuses to learn that lesson and and so if you believe that you are, if you're good at school, you'll be successful in life. When you're really good at school and grad school, and PhD, and who knows what, what that character went through, and you're not as successful as you want, that can create a lot of resentment um, inside of you. Um, resentment that I, I know I felt at a certain point when I couldn't uh, do organic chemistry and become a doctor. Um, so I, I think I put that into the character and Jonathan picked up on it and um, articulated it beautifully. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. I mean, I think we all have, you know, that for like, you know, th this is an industry that we can, we, you know, we work incredibly hard at. I mean, you look at the work that went into this and I think that, you know, we all, we all know what it takes to invest the all of yourself in something. And I think that that, you know, that resentment, although I, I don't hold, I try not to hold resentment in my heart. I, I think that that actually connects a lot to what Keith is, you know, talking about that resentment that, you know, that, that anger, that, you know, he's not willing to put on the institution that he has to focus it on her, you know, because it can't be that the institution is wrong. It has to be that she's wrong. Hmm. Um, so this discussion has a lot of people asking similar questions. They're wondering about uh, the environment on set because, it, hey, if you're coming in and you're being a hateful bastard and resentful bastard and everyone <laughs> and you, you're bringing that energy and there's this antagonism going on between the characters coming in that hard was everyone else feeling that antagonism did the did the antagonism of your characters leak into you guys into your dynamic on set i would say of my experience of jonathan not at all i felt like johnny was like the warmest and most supportive like actor it was such a gift um but i also feel like that couldn't have happened like i i don't think if if any, if we had created that antagonistic atmosphere, I don't, I don't know that we would have felt safe to let our characters release that. Um, in a similar way, like when, yeah, I feel like it gives people permission when they, when they can like ground in and be like, okay, we're safe here. Then we can put on these, put on these roles that are actually just like might be versions of ourselves. So I, I, I think if anything, the environment was like the opposite of like, oh gosh, guys, like we're, we're trapped in this little room that got so hot in oh the Toronto summer and we're like gonna get through this together. Um, so Mpo, man, I just wanted to give your dude a hug. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, I mean, this poor guy, like, I mean, like, here's the thing, you're, you're, you're playing this character, I feel like, I mean, yeah, everyone in this character is looking out for themselves, but yours, yours is, I feel like the most selfless, the one that does, gen all, while he's doing this for his career, he does want to help. But he's also the one character nobody listens to. Like the like like not like, like not like I, I feel compared to all the other characters, uh, you, you're eager to already chime in on this. Tell me. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. Um, in terms of probably being most selfless, I think it may appear as though Micah is the most selfless being brought in to defend Celine in a situation, I keep saying Celine, April, in a situation where uh, she kind of does need the help. But I do think Micah's actually very selfish. 
uh, within his reasons for coming in to defend April. And he may, you know, try to sell the, you know, I got you, I got you, just, just listen to me. But I think he's saying just listen to me so he can shine. Mm. Uh, <laughs> as much as it may appear as though his intentions are to help her. And mm. she definitely does not listen to him when he's attempting to give his uh, spirited advice, I would say. Because I think, uh, I think Mike is somebody that thinks he knows what he's doing, even though he has no experience. So he's coming in to represent April, uh, wanting to sharpen his claws, wanting to get his feet wet as a litigator. Uh, but I also think he's a bit of a show off mm -hmm. because he doesn't really know because he doesn't have experience. But he tells April, hey, hey, just you know, just sit back and let me do the talking and I'll save you and all this. But it, 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 it doesn't really go that way. And April gets righteous and says, mm -hmm. no, Micah, I, I, I got this, bro. So I, I like that about it too. Well, it's interesting. I mean, first of all, because like, I mean, I, I want to point out like every time he gets shot down is hilarious. <laughs> like just the, the express, but but at the same time, is it hilarious? You know, because then when you think about it, it's like, man, the black guy is the one that no one's listening to, and I mean, it's you know, something about today. Go. You know, I I don't I think it's hilarious. Uh, the reason you mentioned is why it's funny, because he's actually saying the right thing, but I don't think they're disrespecting him when they're shutting him down. I don't think it's like shut up. You don't know what you're saying. I think it's more his approach mm. and his delivery. I think he's maybe a bit too forceful with with wanting people to go along with his ideas or wanting to listen to him. I think I think he could approach it a bit better for sure. And right. again, that's his inexperience. I think as much as he's inexperienced as a litigator, I don't think he's very experienced socially. Right, right. So. <laughs> and I think that comes off in his interactions with April. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the in the stairwell stairwell scene, you know, Micah comes with this kind of "how dare you" kind of thing, feeling as though he has some kind of privilege. You know, student advocacy gives him some kind of badge of honor or something, and we all know that's bullshit. So. <laughs> I love it comes yeah. with a dance like this, dude, right? Well, you know, yeah. you know, he, well that's, he, he was, you know, he kind of thought he was cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, he kind of thought he was cool. And he spoke to April that way and she shut him down. She's like, nah, like, maybe I do know what I'm doing. And I want to represent myself. And, and he wasn't ready for that. Right, right, he wasn't right. ready for that. It's, Micah was brought in to save the day, you know? So... <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Lee, what do you? He didn't get a chance to. He didn't get a chance to no. say the name. <laughs> uh, no. no, I just wanted to say I'm I'm really happy that you say that. Um, it was really funny every time they got shot down. That was built in the script, and and you also mentioned that no one listens to Micah's character. But it was also written in the script that he knows more about the law than anybody else in that room. He actually went to two years of law school, which is usually when you become a student advocate. Um, I agree. I also thought it was really funny every time they got shot down because he, he's the yeah. most knowledgeable and he's right most of the time to the point where I think my editor was like, you got to cut some of these out because he just keeps getting shot down. I'm like, no, but it's funny every time. Yeah. <laughs> and the editor was like, come on, man, give him a win once in a while. I was like, all right. All right. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I thought it was clever, too. Definitely. <laughs> well, it also speaks to, uh, first of all, I mean, like, okay, because I, 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 I was relating, I was talking about your character, especially now, when you talk about the context of what's going on now, uh, in terms of anti-black racism and black voices yeah. in media and everything, oh, everyone's having that conversation. Yeah. What's yeah. interesting about this movie is, you know, when this movie first caught my attention, uh, a couple months ago, or maybe, maybe six months ago or so, and we were talking, we were starting our conversations about how are we going to discuss this movie? We were talking about it in the context of coronavirus and anti-Asian discrimination about how Asians are getting a bad rap. And that we thought was going to be the talking point of this movie. The talking point has now shifted. We we're in a whole new moment. We're still in coronavirus and all that stuff. And that stuff's still there. But the conversation is shifted. Still in that. Yeah. yeah. But like, but the conversation, now the focus is also here. And it's interesting how adaptable this movie is. It's like, okay, well, that didn't make this movie any less, 
you know, relevant and less of a talking point. So talk to me about how you guys had to adjust when, I mean, I'm sure, you know, when you were getting ready to, to put this movie out there and you were getting ready to discuss it, you were getting ready to discuss it on those terms. Now you got to talk about new terms, talking about, talk about that adjustment. Uh, so so whoever you, yeah. you, you, yeah. so you go me, you go first. Lead the way. Okay. Um, well, yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Rod. That was something that came up, um, you know, as we were ramping up to start talking about the movie in a public forum. And, and the one thing that I just kept landing on was like, you know, if the question is like, well, this movie was about anti-Asian racism, and now, you know, the conversation is, is rightly shifted to, you know, anti-Black racism and police brutality, like, you know, can you talk about the differences between the two? And I, and my answer to that has always been like, that's the wrong question to be asking. The only question worth asking is why do these institutions, such as the police, such as Ivy League University, such as, you know, whatever, why do they continuously uphold the privilege of whiteness? That is the conversation that we are all trying to have. And I think, um, I think in that both, you know, my movie or the anti-Asian uh, stuff um, correspond. Uh, we are on the same front with the Black Lives Matter movement, essentially. We're just trying to ask that question. Uh, but I would also add that, I mean, this is like, I mean, Mpo says that, yes, so the April is shutting him down because this guy's coming with more swagger than actual, like, like substance, so, so to speak, right? I think it's 50-50. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, he, knows, he knows what he's doing, but he just doesn't know how to sell yeah. it. But I mean, because the thing is, like, and maybe I'm just like the I, I'm 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 going to call everyone racist, including the Asian character, including April, because there is anti-black racism within Asian people, the Asian community, oh, the South right. Asian community, within my community. There's, there's so I I mean I I got the impression that like you know like because we talk about well like yes like the, we, why is the system always privileging white people, but it's privileging Asians and us me to a certain extent as well, right? Yes, I love that you brought that up. Thank you. Um, I think that something that is coming to mind that something that's coming up nowadays that can be really hard to grasp is how racist, how anti-black like I have been, how anti-black all non-black people have been, whether on the conscious level or the subconscious level. We grew up with this programming that, you know, certain people are benefit from this, certain people are Black people are punished for being black. And, and it, can be very, it can be very hard to admit that I have profited from this system. Um, but I think that's maybe one of the first steps is acknowledging that this racism, even if I say, even if my words say, everyone has equal rights, I believe in empowerment for everyone. Um, the fact is I might subconsciously clutch my purse a little closer to me when I'm walking through a black neighborhood. Like this, this programming is just so deep. It's so deep that, and it can feel overwhelming. I think if we take it all on a personal level, like if we get stuck on the, Oh my God, I'm so racist. Like that can also be a block to us moving forward. So I think that that's a great first step is to acknowledge that. And yes, April, like definitely they're shutting down like the black man who's really trying to help her whether or not it's, you know, motivated by his own self-interest. And yes, that subconscious programming is totally in her and it's in me too. Um, so I think starting from this place of, of acknowledging it within ourselves and then we can move on to the systems and be like, okay, let's look at how the systems, let's look at how we've created these systems and how can we, how can we decreate these systems? How can we destroy um, these systems? Uh, Ibram X. Kendi says, there's no, there's no medium between being racist and anti-racist. Like if you're living in the middle ground, um, you are, you're, you don't know that you're profiting from all these racist beliefs. So I think that the large majority of us uh, are being confronted by the fact that we have been living in the middle ground. Um, and maybe it's a bit shameful that it's taken us so long to, to come to action, but like instant forgiveness, this is the time, let's move forward. You know, um, I... I, I, it's, it's, it's amazing points that you make, <laughs> Celine. And yeah, amazing, amazing points. Bringing up April even. I think April's character is dealing with misogyny as well at a hyper kind of extensive level 
on top of whatever racism she was dealing with <laughs> in, in, in the film. So we're throwing like two blades at April and without anyone to really understand, truly, truly understand what she's going through. Even, even Micah being a black man is not gonna know what that Asian woman is going through. So even within that feeling of maybe being shut down by April, M Micah's not gonna be able to turn around and understand how she's feeling being in that room full of men. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there's so many perspectives and it's so good to have all of these voices to be able to speak from these perspectives. Because I probably wouldn't have made the points that that Celine made, and, and I wouldn't make the points that you made, not because I don't know them. I probably wouldn't think of them. You know, there's something else that I'd rather say. So it, it's good that we're all here giving all these points of view and these perspectives. Yeah. And we um, can talk about this all day. It's like it's yeah. not like there's just a cutoff point for a conversation like this. You, you know, it's yeah. it's 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 ongoing. And I I I believe a project like this shines light on not only the 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 racism within the systems, but it it, it shines a positive light on people of color leading films. And, and I think it's a beautiful thing to have Celine starring in a film like this. I think it's a beautiful thing to have this film written by a Lee Dong. I think, I think it's beautiful for myself to be a part of this. Jonathan as well. There's a, it's, it's a beautiful mix of actors in here. Sue Jif is in here. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think Lee's doing his best when it comes to the representation aspect of things. And, that's all you can do. You know, well, speaking to the representation, having you guys, you know, Lee leading, Lee leading the charge and all the, this diverse mix of cat, like actors in this movie. Uh, I want to know, like, I mean, do you guys, when you're looking, when you're looking um, at April's struggle, at, uh, at Makai's struggle, at, every, at least the, these, everyone's struggle in the movie, uh, and Lee, when you were shaping this, did you also see your struggle or everyone else's struggle within the film industry reflected in this struggle that you're depicting in the movie? Um, uh, certainly a little bit. I, I suppose that struggle is in every aspect of, of my life and, you know, a lot of people of color's lives, no matter what industry they're in. Um, the mm -hmm. film industry just happens to be the one that I chose. But, but yes, uh, there are people that um, look at you a certain way or think that you can't be, let's say, like, you know, people think that I can't be creative a certain way or funny a certain way, um, but that I can do math, which, by the way, I cannot do at all. Um, so... So yeah, you, you are going to get looked at a little bit differently. Um, and yeah, those struggles do exist um, in every industry. Um, and I think I tried to put a lot of my university specific um, struggles into this movie um, you know, because it was, yeah, because it, it suited the storyline. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm gonna kind of detour for a second. Uh, uh, I'm, gonna I'm, gonna, I'm gonna point out something. Uh, there's two actors in this movie who starred in American Pie Beta House. <laughs> One of them is Jonathan Keltz. Yep. Okay. Say hello, Johnny. Uh, hey, the guys. other is Vas Saranga. Now, this is a movie that was shot in U of T around 2006. So when I say a detour, there's, the reason I'm saying there's a detour is because I got a story to tell. Uh, so... In 2006, I was the film critic for U of T's paper, The Varsity. Uh, I was invited to the set of American Pie Beta House to, for a couple of days to, to view what was going on on set, to observe the set, and to interview the directors and the producers and the cast and whatnot. Um, so, so I did this. I walked through U of T. Uh, you know, like, uh, it was, I was doing it for the paper. I walked through U of T. I get to the set. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the most immediate thing I observe is I'm walking through U of T, you know how diverse it is when you, you're on campus, but then you get to this set and all of a sudden it's just bleach blondes everywhere, right? Bleach blondes everywhere except for Vasaranga's character. Vasaranga's character in this movie was the most stereotypical, like, Apu-like character you could imagine. Um, so, you know, after I'm doing my interviews and such, uh, the publicist comes to me and she's like, well, uh, so is there anyone else you'd like to interview? I'm like, that guy. I want to interview that guy. I'm pointing at Vass now, right? And she's like, why? I'm like, 
look fucking look it <laughs> right like why do you think i want to interview her right the last question is that yeah, yeah but as soon as she got a whiff of where i was going with it man she they bought like bawled me out tore me a new one i'm a student film critic by the way remember i'm in school i've never you know i don't know much so she was like tearing into me trying to chase me off set saying she's going to threaten to sue me with libel um i've never told this story by the way a lot so she threatened to sue me with libel uh and that that basically scared the shit out of me so that was in 2006 so for like a decade i never talked about diversity i thought that was a thing that fuck man i'll remove review movies i'll do them whatever and it took a decade for me to finally come out and and then and finally discuss these things that are going on now so i just it's such a it's so ironic now that vasaranga in this movie is playing a student journalist who is now trying to tell a story about race issues on campus after 13 years after I was a student journalist who got eight tore out for trying to interview Vasaranga wow. about this situation. So Jonathan, now you know why I'm about to pick on you. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, but, absolutely. You know, no, I mean, the thing is like, so you've been on this journey now you've been on the, the beginning to you, you with me with Vas, you, you were at the beginning of this journey yeah. to the end. And what a fucking difference in terms of movies that you made at U of T. Think about like, like the, the, so talk to me about totally. that. Totally. Well, I mean, it's so interesting. It's like on top of that, uh, there's another uh, BIPOC, you know, actor in that film, a fantastic actor, Toronto actor by the name of Shamari Downer, who was virtually cut out of the film. You know, there's a whole host of characters, himself included, that didn't really make the film. You know what I mean? So yeah. there, like that, like there, it was. There is even more behind the scenes to all of that. I mean, I think that I actually, I didn't. I didn't place the significance of this, the location, you know, of it. And I think that, you know, I think that, I mean, if we, if, if we look at that movie, we just recently, you know, had, a, you know, sort of before all this went down, a, a, a hang with some friends where we all picked some footage from, you know, the most embarrassing projects that we've been a part of. And you can be sure that that's the footage that I brought to the party. I mean, that was, like if you think, first of all, in terms of the framing, like you said, this is this is U of T. And even though it doesn't take place there, any university is gonna have that diversity. There's no diversity in that film. And then if you look at the rampant misogyny and sexism, it's, I mean, it's outrageous. And, and, and something that became exponentially worse in each iteration of the film, you know? And I think that I, because of you know of of being a uh, white man, I had the privilege of not realizing, not realizing the 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 what it means to be a part of these types of projects. And I think as a young actor, you know, you you don't you don't think choice is part of it. You know what I mean? You're just looking for the work that you can get. And I don't say that as an excuse i'm saying that as something of shame for myself that like there doesn't matter the experience level that you have you should know and you should actively choose the things that you are participating in you know and i think that that's something that i'm hoping is such a conversation as a whole and i think that you know everything that you're you know we're talking about and lee was talking about how you know this is something that's you know an issue in all industries it is absolutely an issue in all industries but this industry specifically is the one that projects the standards out to the world. You know, this is the one that is, yeah. that is going into the conscious and the subconscious of the world. You know, yeah. that American Pie movie, I have been recognized for probably more than anything in my career. And it's happened globally, globally in South America, in Europe, all over the place, you know, and, that, I mean, you know, that's, as you said, 13 years ago. And that's American Pie 6. You know what I mean? Like, that's, it's crazy for that to be something. And, and, and again, you know, it's got that American word and national label on it, you know? So, of course, that's going to be branded as American Values Beta House, you know? This is frat culture, you know? And it's, it's, it's a it's nauseatingly astounding, like going back and seeing some of that stuff. And, you know, I, I think that for me, I, 
you know, I, I really, I, I think that I've, I've learned a tremendous amount in my, you know, in my career and certainly in the last three weeks and just about what it means, you know, to, to, to be, you know, an ally and the shameful definition that I thought that I had, you know, and, 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 and identified as and what the actual work really means and the responsibility of this, this industry and those of us that participate in it, you know, to make sure that we are, you know, actively choosing and participating what it is that we want to be the reflection of the world. And I'm very fortunate that I've tried to be a part of that, you know, for some time now, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think representation, which is something we've touched on a couple of different times, is so important and something that I've learned, you know, so much through the relationship that I have with my my partner, who is an amazing uh, Brazilian Canadian actress, uh, Liza de Oliveira. And, you know, she, like, it's, we've, we've been together a long time and, and, something that was such a shift for me was just realizing all of the things that I took for granted and the characters and the roles and the shows because like that, just that I was represented in them, that people that looked like me was, were represented in them. And, and then just seeing the stark realization that she had of like, of not feeling that way. Like it was such an illuminating thing, like where, you know, it like the idea of, of feeling like so much didn't represent who she was or who she was when she was younger, or who she wants to be when she's older. And I feel like, I, you know, I, I, I hope to, to continue to be part of that change. You know what I mean? I'm fortunate that I also get to work uh, behind the camera as well as a producer. And that's something that I think that, you know, we have such an incredible, you know, uh, amazing industry and talent pool in Toronto and in Canada, you know, and I think that we as, as filmmakers and as people in this industry, we got to hold ourselves accountable to the projects that we are a part of and the representation in front of the camera, behind the camera and the messages that people are absorbing consciously for sure, but almost more importantly, subconsciously from what it is that they're seeing. And I, 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 I am an optimistic person, you know, by nature, but I, I'm really hopeful that we're at a turning point right now to, to the fact that the dialogue, you know, the dialogue is happening at, at a volume that I've never experienced it, you know, and I'm hoping that's a momentum that we all can take the responsibility to maintain. You know what, Jonathan, I love you. <laughs> See, <laughs> let me tell you something. That's something, like I said, I never revealed it, but I mean, I was so happy to see when I made the connections and I'm like, I'm so glad you made this movie because uh, it really kind of brought everything full circle and it really kind of just put some closure to that chapter of my life. Well, and, and well, before that, let me just, uh, you know, let me just apologize to you because that's completely unacceptable. And, and I'm sorry to have been part of a project that made you feel that way. Oh. And, you know, and I'm so glad that we get to have this moment here to discuss it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, look, I'm going to I gotta uh, ask one more of my questions for Lee before I go back to the audience questions. Lee, um, I mean, so this uh, this movie is based around a newspaper. I'll uh, be sorry, uh, a, a research paper that is about world, the Second World War. It's about the Japanese. Uh, what they, this, this, the, the whole argument is about how the Japanese, um, what is it, played the victim card? in Hiroshima for treatment. optics yeah. sorry the Hasegawa treatment yeah yeah, yeah. so it was like it was like they like they, they didn't surrender because of the nuclear bombs they surrendered because of a deal with Russia but they played the victim card and used that the, uh, the nuclear bombs as a way so that for the international community to not penalize them now what are we saying when you in include that as the center of this movie when we're talking about race and optics in April's situation and everyone's situation in this movie I've been dying for someone to ask me this question. I was like, ready for it. I was like, please, someone ask me this. Um, the Hasegawa interpretation suggests that the Japanese were basically as aggressive as, as the Nazis, but they just, they got bombed and then they, they played the victim card and the international community felt sorry for them and all this. So the, the two dueling views of the Japanese after World War II was one, they were victims of this huge atrocity and they 
pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and you know got back on on the proper road to recovery and the other one the hasagawa interpretation suggests like no they were like kind of bad people and they like really were not did not have good intentions right if they could have they would have taken over the world and it's only because this deal with the russians fell through so i think that i i thought when i read about that i thought it was such a perfect thing to put in this movie because I feel like those are the two ways that as soon as you see it, uh, Celine's character, April, you can feel one way or the other. You're either going to look at her and be like, she is an innocent angel who is under terrible persecution, or you can think like, no, she's shifty. She's here to like get her way and to manipulate and to win at all costs. Um, so that's why I put that essay in there as a sort of metaphor. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. To so me, it was, I, I, I'm so happy you picked up on that. Oh my God, I've been dying. <laughs> it's oh, my job. Thank you. <laughs> um, when I read that part in the script, it didn't feel like this, it didn't feel like the movie was anything to do. Like the focus wasn't on, um, on how Japan emerged from the Second World, World War, but I think it really, it pinpointed that thing that you're talking about, Lee, about how this you know, everyone has that good cop, bad cop, or good side, bad side within them. And so it's like, it's, I really enjoy seeing the film from the lens of today um, because we can see that like, everyone's working from their own motives. And so they're like, there are no good guys. You know, we're all bad guys. Sorry, I just laughed just earlier because Celine said the lens of today, obviously she means the state of the world. But can we just say Celine's only seen yeah. the movie for the first time today? Like today? <laughs> I watched the movie. Hey, I haven't I'm watched it yet. Finished. I didn't watch it yet. Oh, what? You Shit. Watch. You guys are Yo, great. Yo, bro, I, hey, not that I don't want to watch it, but I'm that guy that's like, I'll be good. I'm good. I don't need to see myself. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I am usually so self-conscious when I watch myself, and yeah. I just can't stop cringing. Lee, yeah. this was actually maybe one of the only projects that I've that I've watched myself in and I'm like oh I'm actually like not just be like oh this I did a great job but like I'm I'm really absorbed it was like I'm so absorbed in in the message of what this is saying that I was kind of distracted that it was me so. you were focused you were focused, focused. you were focused yes. this, and that's My why you did eyes. so well that's why you did so well <laughs> that's why you did so well oh you're so yo kind. yo Rad I, I I think we I think we answered a few more of the questions but I wanted I wanted to say say something else about the diversity conversation. I wanted mm -hmm. to pivot uh, a lot of what Jonathan was saying. I, I was really digging and holding people accountable and, and things of that nature. I think, like I spoke about with Lee leading the charge, creating f diverse projects. A lot of what needs to change specifically in this industry, as well as under other industries, but specifically this industry. We, we need people that are not white creating stories about themselves. We need people from ethnic backgrounds, racialized communities, empowered in higher up positions in these studios to do the hiring of people so they can hold these studios accountable within these processes. Because we're, we're putting the onus on white people to know what to do. And, and that's unfair. We, 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 we can't have white people being in these positions, being responsible for these hirings, being responsible for writing these projects. We need to hire more Lee Dongs to write these hey, projects. That, we need to hire, he, he we need to hire, sure. we need to hire more people in the echelon positions of these studios that are not white, that make decisions on green lighting projects, that decide what projects get developed, and then maybe things start to shift. But if we're still in a spot where everybody at the higher up in the studio is white, and we're relying on them to know what to do with their diverse cast or their diversity quota, we're kind of headed for failure. Well, yeah. I, absolutely. I think that, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think that what so many people have tried to hide behind is this diversity push in the industry that's about, uh, you know, casting uh, with a diverse lens and, and finding all that. But, it, you know, most of the time, those are still 
it's still diversity to support white led stories and it's or or diversity to execute a white led you know project from behind the scenes and there was just this you know this report that i saw where it was it was just it was just photos just photos of all of the senior executives of their like about us page from studios from streamers from everybody and these are the people that are choosing where to invest the money in the projects that are the reflection of society if those groups are in a reflection of society how how can we expect them to spend the time to even educate themselves on what an accurate reflection of society is you know i mean i i think that we're you know we 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 just we there's a huge responsibility on the moment to make sure that this becomes about a reflection of life and about the world and right now what that means is we got to we got to we have a lot of overcorrecting that needs to happen you know what i mean like there's so much we that we unlearn a lot we of have things. to unlearn and and you know and just and invest the money where it's going to do the most you know if you are a canadian filmmaker that is listening like there is an amazing uh, you know a canadian vipoc filmmaker there's an amazing organization called film in color where you can make sure that you are represented and you can be contacted by people who are actively searching and if you are somebody who is uh, with power with money that you can put you know towards people get on there and find the projects and find the filmmakers you know that that need to have their stories told um you know i i think that we just we we as a society have a tremendous amount of responsibility and it's i mean the fact that in this moment you know so many people in canada can say things like well really is systemic racism an issue here that's an american problem that's one of the most ignorant, rude, appalling things that one can say. That's something that we spoke about when we were making the film two years ago and having this film be something that would showcase a side of that. It's two years later, it's however many, I mean, you know, when it, 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 there's just too much. And the fact that, you know, that, if we had hung up on that question, then we're not actually solving anything because then what happens is people are debating whether or not it exists rather than actually doing things to solve the problem and to fix things. Look at what just Arguing happened. Arguing about the wrong things. Look at what just happened to NDP leader saying this week. You know what I mean? It's like, it, we, we got to get past the, does this exist? Own the fact, accept it, and fix it. Look, guys, I think we need to go out on that note. <laughs> I mean, like, like, I'm telling you, the, I mean, congrats, like, uh, amen to everything y'all are saying. Uh, and, and, but, and like, I, I'm just so appreciating hearing from all of you and hearing you guys engage with this. But, you know, I totally did not know I was going to be out here in the dark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I totally no, did you not got, plan you this. Kids, you know, I, I did not know plan hey, this Q&A right where I'm going to sit on a porch. Man. Sorry? Those Toronto raccoons, man. No, man, Sorry. they're coming. They're coming. I'm seeing them. I'm seeing Sorry, them coming. You, <laughs> but listen, listen, thank you all for coming and being a part of this. Thank you for your film. Thank you, Game Theory uh, Films, for putting this all together. Remember, Stealing School is currently on Vimeo On Demand, and it will be on Apple TV and iTunes on Tuesday. So check it out then. Um, let's say goodnight. Thank you all. Right. Thank <laughs> you very cheers. much. Let's get those thank drinks so going. Much. Yeah, cheers, guys. <laughs>